Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. And we're going to uh, look particularly at verse 31, but uh, let me just read it in its context. In, in the larger context, it is talking about eating and drinking with regard to things sacrificed to idols. We need to make sure that um, when we eat what we eat, that we eat it in a way that's appropriate, that we don't eat it as something sacrificed, obviously, to a demon that would be very dishonoring to the Lord if we should be in such a situation, which isn't very common these days. However, the principle is still true, isn't it? That we need to be careful in whatever we do to do it all to God's glory, even in the things that we eat. So by way of extension, we'll see that this text applies to everything that we do. But this is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 and following. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you wish to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone should say to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I do not mean your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, that they may be saved. So the idea of the witness of our eating and drinking, of course, and the things that we do, but I think even um, we can apply it to uh, even the things that we eat or drink or whatever we do, we obviously need to make sure that we do it in faith and in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God. Now, in our evening study, we have been considering what is the most important thing uh, in the Christian life, which is walking uh, with God. And I hope we realize by now that we can't just live any way that we want to live and expect that God is going to be with us. If we desire God's presence in our lives, we have to be holy, just as the Lord would not be with his people Israel if there was sin in the camp. And remember the, the case with Achan, how he took something that was under the ban when, when Jericho was destroyed, and because of that, uh, because of that sin, God was not with them when they went out to battle. God is not going to be with us if we entertain sin, if we allow some sin in our lives. We need something more, in other words, than just, uh, and this, this may sound strange, but we need more than just positional holiness before the Lord, more than the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, which comes through faith in his name. We also need to be seeking to live a practically holy life. I mean, it is true that we can be genuine believers, but we can be also falling into particular sins, which is going to hinder our walk with God. We need to make sure that we're repenting of all sin and that we are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. We are to do, as our Lord Jesus Christ told us, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And he means, of course, morally perfect. Now, with this in mind, we looked at certain things that would be helpful for us to do on a daily basis to help us walk with God. How helpful it would be uh, to examine our hearts every day according to God's law as we look in the mirror to remind ourselves to look in the mirror of God's law to see our defects, to see what we need to confess, what we need to amend, what we need to fight against. At the same time, to look in the mirror of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to see the face of Christ and the encouragement that he gives to us as well as the promise that he's going to help us overcome these things. And with this knowledge that we gain from that, to enter into prayer with our Lord, once we're humbled, to be able to adore him for who he is and what he is, to confess the sins that he's revealed to us in our examination, to thank him for the blessings that he has given to us and the answers to prayer, as well as humbly to ask him for the things that 
uh, we need. Now we saw that once we're done with our prayer, then we need to set our hearts to do what the Lord has called us to do. We saw that there is no one that God made simply to play. And that really comes into, um, I think, our topic this evening, although just very generally. God hasn't made anyone just to spend their whole lives playing and wasting their time. He made us to work. And once we are ready then, once we are prepared, we need to begin to do that work. We need to begin to do our duty. We need to do it diligently. We need to do it cheerfully. But if we happen to be the head of a household, our first duty is to gather our family together and to conduct worship. And after we have ministered to them, after we have fed our household, once we have prayed together with them, once we have worshipped together with them, then to set our hearts to do what the Lord has called us to do in the particular calling He has placed upon our lives. Now this evening, we're going to look at, well actually we're looking at a passage that reminds us that if we are to walk with God, that there is no detail that is too small that we don't have to bring into our view. We need to make sure that everything that we do, even the smallest and most mundane details of our lives are done according to the will of God. The Bible says, whatever is not of faith is sin. And if we do not know that we have uh, the right to do these things, that the things that we're going to do are not glorifying to God, then we should not be doing them at all. Everything we do either pleases the Lord or displeases the Lord. And that means not only what we do, but also the way that we do it. And if that's true, then it also applies to even the small details of eating, as well as recreation and everything else that we do. Now tonight I want us to consider how to walk with God in the things that we do to refresh ourselves. Refreshment might be the the broader rubric under which eating and drinking and recreation would fall under. How do we do these things to give glory to God? So first of all, let's consider how we are to eat and drink for God's glory. And then secondly, how to recreate in a way that glorifies Him. Some of these things are going to be obvious, some things perhaps not quite so obvious. But it's always good to be reminded of what the Lord has us to do because we often forget and lose our resolve to do these things, but they are important. So first of all, let's consider how we are to eat and drink to the glory of God. Remember that uh, the Lord has created food and drink and recreation to refresh our bodies. Uh, we might say that really eating too is a means of recreation in the sense that we're going to be looking at it this evening. Recreation means recreation. Sometimes, at least, well, that's at least how it's been used in the past. It may not mean that to us today, but that's the way we ought to view it. We, we do certain things during the day that wear us out. We get tired and we need to be recreated, especially if we're working diligently in the things that we do. We grow tired and we need refreshment. We need it on a daily basis. We can't just go full steam all day and uh, not wear out. We need rest. And you know as well as I do, when you uh, are giving yourself diligently to your work over a period of time, eventually you reach the point where you need a vacation, a more extended rest. Uh, and so, uh, again, that's um, a form of recreation. But this is the way that the Lord has made us. He's made us so that we, we can't really pursue things with a great deal of effort for very long before we run out of gas. And we need food and we need rest. And we see this, I think, more clearly when we do things that are very difficult. I mean, take off running at top speed and see how far you're going to get before you need to rest. Or I learned it uh, this past summer when I was digging in that uh, baked clay that, that we call a backyard, trying to dig ditches to put a drain in. Uh, you don't have to swing that pick very many times before you realize you're not going to get very far without some rest. We, God has made us that way. He has made us without unlimited energy. We don't have limitless energy. We are weak and we are dependent. And the Lord wants us to see that we are so that we will rely upon Him more and less upon ourselves. So we do need to stop periodically. We need to rest. We need to refresh ourselves. And when we do this, we need to make sure that we do it for God's glory as in this as well as in everything else. As Paul tells us in our passage, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. So how can we eat for God's glory? Well, there's a few things that we can think about. And um, uh, the first thing I think is quite obvious. We need to make sure that whatever we have to eat, whatever the Lord gives to us, that we thank Him for it before we eat it. How many of you uh, spend some time thanking the Lord before you, uh, you eat your meals and giving Him praise that He's provided these things, asking Him to bless these things to nourish your body? Well, that's exactly what the Bible tells us we ought to do. Paul writes to Timothy, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. We need to recognize that God is the source of every mouthful, and it would be very ungrateful for us not to thank him. I mean, as parents, we know how it feels when we're... And, and children, when you grow up, you're going to experience the same thing. So don't feel like you're being singled out. It's just, it's just our nature when we're children. We, we take for granted everything that our parents do for us. And as parents, sometimes it, it might get kind of wearying for us because we, we lay ourselves out to take care of our children. We do so much for them. And sometimes we're expecting uh, perhaps a thank you in return. And maybe we don't get that thank you. And maybe sometimes some worse things happen where they uh, not only don't give us thanks, but do things that dishonor us, and that's, that's very sad. But you know how we feel as parents. Well, how does the Lord feel when He's continually giving to us good things and we don't stop to give Him thanks as we receive those things from His hands? We need to make sure that we are not treating Him as sometimes we're treated in an ungrateful way. Make sure that you pause to thank God before you eat. Now, a second thing, and... This is something that we may not have difficulty with, at least as we, as we hear about it, but some people do, and maybe some of us do in particular contexts. Certainly the food that we eat should be our own food and not somebody else's. In other words, um, we need to make sure that uh, we are working hard to earn that bread and that we're not just taking advantage of other people. As a matter of fact, sometimes um, people like to be invited over to other people's homes and when they're there, they like to eat a lot of their food uh, and in doing so really take advantage of them. Actually, they're stealing. That's a form of stealing. Uh, there was a, um, a family, I guess you could call it a family, a very dysfunctional family that uh, would, would show up at our fellowship meals. And each time the, the, uh, the, the woman and her son and so forth would come in, they would, they would cart away platefuls of, of food and, and not stay here any longer than it took just to get the food. And each time they would come, we would say, you need to come to the service before you, you uh, participate in this, you know, take this food before you eat. And each time they would always have an excuse why they couldn't make it to the service, but uh, would still want to take the food. Well, what they were doing was they were stealing from us in a certain sense because they were being dishonest. We need to make sure that we don't do the same thing. Obviously, there are those who don't like to work and, as I've said, like to take advantage of others. The Lord tells us we need to work for our own bread. Paul writes to the Thessalonians. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Some people actually sort of, um, I don't know, get, get a, a delight, I suppose, a certain kick out of, being able to get something for nothing. Uh, Augustine once wrote that, um, and he was speaking about in his confessions, he was expressing the sinfulness of his own heart, and he recounts uh, an instance where he and some friends stole some pears from a neighbor's tree. Now, he and his family had their own tree, they had their own pears, they didn't need the neighbor's pears, they weren't uh, hungry or starving or anything like that, they just wanted to do it because it could be done, they just wanted to steal. And they found that when they got those pears, that those pears actually tasted better than, the par than, the, than his parents' pears. And yet there really wasn't any real difference between them, except one of them was stolen and the other one was not. The thing that made it sweeter, he finally concluded, what made it taste better was the sin that, uh, that he was engaged in. Well, obviously that is, um, is stealing. It's not earning your own food. 
Now, things like that might be sweeter, as Augustine found, until we are called to account for those things. Then it's not so sweet. Solomon writes in Proverbs 20, verse 17, Bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. If it's not filled with gravel when he's caught in this life, it certainly will be in the judgment to come. Now again, that may not necessarily apply to us. We may not be given to stealing, but uh, there's that passage of Scripture that um, I often think about when, when, you, when you go to someone's house and there's food set before you. Uh, Solomon warns, if it happens to be a rich man, put a knife to your throat and don't desire his delicacies. Don't eat too much. Don't fall into that same kind of snare. But there is a principle that's involved in this. And that is when we're invited to somebody's house, don't take advantage of them. You know, eat moderately. And don't take from them uh, what they didn't really intend to give you. They want to share things. Make sure you don't take advantage of them. Now thirdly, and this is what we usually think about when we think about eating and drinking to the glory of God. There are sins that we need to avoid. The sins of gluttony. The sins of drunkenness. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too much. Moderation in everything. Now, we'd all agree that drunkenness is something that is sinful and we avoid it, but sometimes we don't look at gluttony the same way. We need to, I, I, though, uh, be careful how we define it because I don't think that it's what we necessarily think it is. Gluttony is not just simply being overweight. Gluttony is being addicted to food. It's being a lover of pleasure, that particular kind of pleasure. And addiction to any pleasure is sin. Whether it be food, whether it be drink, whether it be television, whether it be video games, whether it be sports, addiction to any pleasure is sinful. Everything needs to be done in moderation and for the right purpose. Now, gluttons are those who eat far more than they need. They relish food too much. They're obsessed with it. They're addicted to it. It's like drunkenness, only with food. But unlike drunkenness, which you can easily see, if someone happens to be an alcoholic or happens to be drunk at that particular time, you can't always see gluttony. As a matter of fact, um, I knew a person who uh, actually was, was a glutton, but he was thin as a rail. He just didn't gain weight from all the food he was eating, but he would eat many times more than he really needed to eat. There are some people who can do that and get away with it. Uh, so a glutton doesn't have to be someone who's necessarily overweight. As a matter of fact, there are passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that gluttony has nothing to do with, with how fat we might happen to be. I, I'm thinking of this uh, particular passage in Psalm 73, 3 through 7, where the psalmist, as he's listing the blessings that, uh, that the Lord has given to the ungodly, and he's... Uh, stumbling because of that, because he's, he's basically thin, he doesn't have enough to eat, and, and he's going through difficult times, but it's not the same way with, with the arrogant. Uh, he writes this, and I, I really can't understand how he could be envying their weight, as it were, uh, if it was something that was sinful. Okay? He says, For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. There is some question about what it means that their eyes are bulging from fatness. <laughs> but you get the, the idea. Uh, the literal idea is that their eyes literally are bulging because their body is so heavy it's kind of pushing their eyes out in a certain sense. But you can see how it, it can be applied in other ways. You know, I read an article recently that uh, being too thin might actually be harmful to your health. And having a bit of excess body, body weight, uh, people who have, or are moderately, let's say, just maybe, you know, not grossly overweight, but moderately overweight, actually there's evidence that they live longer, that they have a healthier life. So fatness is not altogether a bad thing. Sometimes it's, it's used as a symbol of prosperity and blessing. I think the warning that, that is here in gluttony is the warning against being addicted to food. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy a good meal, that we shouldn't enjoy food, but it means that we need to eat 
in moderation. The point is this. We need to eat to refresh ourselves and to gain strength from our food and not merely for pleasure. Now notice I didn't say not for pleasure. We can enjoy our food, but not merely for pleasure. We need to eat those things that will help us serve the Lord better. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, is an example, in, in, to me at least, in, in many different areas. And, and he didn't leave, it seemed, any stone unturned when it came to doing things that would help him serve the Lord better. So Jonathan Edwards, with his very scientific mind, whenever he ate something, would always write down the effects of that food on his body. Do I feel better since I ate this? Do I have a clearer mind? Am I able to study better and serve the Lord better? If so, he would keep eating those things. But if it was something that dulled his mind and took away his energy, he'd, he'd stop eating that. I hope we all uh, do those kinds of things, especially when you get a little bit older. You're looking for things that you can eat that will improve your energy, you know, and uh, try, try to, to get everything that you can. I mean, just think about um, when you eat, if you eat too much or if you eat certain kinds of food. I remember one time uh, years ago when I was an assistant pastor at a, at a Calvary Chapel down in uh, Southern California, that I went out to eat with one of the members. He invited me out. We went to this Mexican restaurant, and I, I ordered the, uh, the beef burrito that turned out to be these two huge beef burritos, just full, just so full of, of this roast beef. And I, I tried to eat them all. That was my mistake. I was so dull-minded after that that I couldn't do a thing. Uh, the Lord was telling me that it's not wise to eat a huge lunch, and especially certain kinds of food that your body can't digest quickly so you can continue to work. We need to eat in such a way that it helps us do what we need to do and doesn't hinder us. If the goal is refreshment, then stuffing is not the way to obtain it. Now listen to what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 10, verses 16 through 17. I think this is, this is I mean, very insightful, of course, from the wisest man who ever lived next to our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Woe to you, O land! whose king is a lad, and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility, and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. In other words, they're eating appropriately. They're eating for strength. They're eating to do what it is they need to do, not just to uh, you know, have all this pleasure that um, puts them in a condition where they really can't rule righteously or justly. Now I think it goes without saying that the Lord has also given to us uh, drink, and when the Bible talks about drink, it's not always talking about uh, non-alcoholic beverages. As a matter of fact, it's mostly talking about alcoholic beverages. That the Lord gives those things to us and that they are good and they are to be received with thanksgiving, but we need to use them moderately. As the Lord condemns addiction to food, which he calls gluttony, he also condemns Drunkenness. I don't think I have to labor that point, but let me just read a couple passages. Uh, Paul in Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That applies both to eating and drinking. And Solomon writes in Proverbs 23, 20, and 21, Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. If you're addicted to food and drink, it will make you unable to do what the Lord has called you to do. As you know, addiction to any pleasure will do that. We need to make sure that we don't get addicted to anything so that that's all we can do, that's all we can think about. It possesses us, it becomes an idol. And that, as I've said, can be anything. It doesn't have to be food or drink or anything in particular. It can be anything at all. So be careful when you eat, when you drink, do it to refresh yourself. Do it so that it helps you serve the Lord in your calling. Not so that it takes away from what you're doing. Now secondly, let's consider how we are to recreate for God's glory. These are actually two big subjects, but I'll again try to give just general principles. Remember again that recreation means recreation. The first thing that we 
that we ought to do to recreate ourselves or recreate ourselves is probably the last thing that we actually do, sadly. And we don't often think about it as recreation, but it is. And that is, we need to spend time with the Lord. That is the ultimate recreation. Now, let's not forget that heaven, that we're all aspiring to enter into one day, is actually called rest, isn't it? Rest from our work. And when we spend time with the Lord, that gives rest to our souls, or at least it should. When you grow tired of the world and the things in the world, its work or its trials, its temptations, and I think particularly the sins that we have to contend with, then it's best, if we want to be recreated, to spend more time with the Lord every day. And I say more time because we've already seen that we need to spend time in prayer in the morning, examining our hearts by the Word of God, looking at the Gospel, reminding ourselves what Christ Jesus has done. We need to gather together for family worship, but sometimes we need more if we need to be refreshed, if we need to be strengthened. Getting alone with the Lord is not only for when your life is caving in, it should be on a daily basis, again, to refresh your soul. Spend some time in prayer. The psalmist writes in Psalm 34, verses 4 through 6, I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. If the things of the world are making you weary, then you need to come to the Lord for refreshment. Come to Him in prayer. Spend some time with Him in His Word and meditating upon His Word. The psalmist writes in Psalm 94, 19, When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. And I think he's referring to those that are found in the promises of God's Word. Meditate on a promise. You'll find it to be very refreshing. Spend some time singing and worshiping the Lord. That's often very encouraging and very refreshing to the soul, as well as spending time with other Christians, not only, of course, to lay your, or, you know, to help, well, to share your burden with them, that they might uh, share it with you, but just to be encouraged by them. It's encouraging to get together with brethren and to talk about the things of the Lord. Certainly in the context of public worship, but also in private, Paul writes Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It has a very um, upbeat kind of tone to it, because when you do this, it's very refreshing. So one way to recreate yourself, to get recreation, is to spend time with the Lord. We don't often think of recreation that way, do we? We think, usually, of doing things that wear us down even further, like playing organized sports or things like that. But that's not so much what we're looking at here, except to say that most sports are not very recreative. They're usually very uh, detrimental in, in many ways, especially if you're tired. I mean, if you're tired, you're not going to go out and play you know, several rounds of, of, of particular sports are going to wear you out even more. Now, a second thing you can do to recreate is try to do something different than what you're doing. Sometimes recreation doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean you have to stop working. Sometimes it means just doing some different kind of work. I mean, when we're talking about rest, it doesn't mean just doing nothing. Sometimes our weariness comes from doing the same thing too much. I mean, if you're a teacher, you know what that means. You can get tired of teaching. You can get tired of studying. You can get tired of talking. There's, there's so many things. If you do it enough times, you just get tired of it. So if you're tired of doing one thing, try something else. If you're tired of doing mental work, don't think that the only thing that's going to give you rest is doing nothing. Sometimes doing physical work will give you rest. Or if you're tired of doing physical work, do something mental instead. And I don't mean by mental something crazy, but... Do something that is, uh, that is mentally oriented. Or if one particular mental kind of work is wearing you out, try some other kind. Or if one kind of physical work, try some other kind of physical work. Try to break up the monotony of the day if you're able to do it. Sometimes what our soul needs to recreate itself is variety and not inactivity. 
Now thirdly, and here we're beginning to get into those areas we're more familiar with, make sure that the recreation you choose is not offensive to God. Make sure it's not a sinful activity. And I'm not, I'm not thinking that, well, we're going to get to some, some down, the, uh, down this list that, that may be th some things we don't often think about, but maybe we do when we see particular types of recreations and sports. But make sure that the recreation you choose is not going to offend the Lord. And, and one very important application of this principle is to make sure that your recreation on the Lord's Day is something that's appropriate for the Lord's Day. Um, make sure that it fits what the Lord tells us ought to be done on this day. And this, this should really be our overriding principle, Isaiah 58, verses 13 through 14. He says, If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord's. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What does the word Sabbath mean? mean? It means rest, doesn't it? And it means we're supposed to rest on this day. We're supposed to rest from our work, as the uh, fourth commandment reminds us, not to do any work on this day. And we're to, well, if we're to rest, that means that we have to do things that aren't going to tax us. We have to do things that are recreative. And we need to make sure that they're not worldly things that are going to draw our attention away from the Lord but things that will draw our attention to the Lord, things that are God-oriented, things that are refreshing in particular to the soul because the Sabbath is a picture of heavenly rest. It's really a foreshadowing of the rest we're going to enter into in heaven. And when we get to heaven, notwithstanding all those funeral services you may have been to that, that tell you that, you that this departed loved one is fishing or playing football or baseball, that's not what's going on in heaven. Those kinds of things don't even enter into the, the minds of the saints. And if that was the thing you loved most of all in life, then perhaps, you know, that person who departed, perhaps that's not where they, where they are in heaven. Because you need to love the Lord most of all. You need to love uh, your Lord Jesus Christ and look forward to seeing Him. So the kinds of things that go on in heaven are the kinds of things we ought to be doing on the Lord's Day, the things, again, that draw us near to the Lord. Now, that's not to say that sometimes, that well, it's always inappropriate, I should say, uh, to do any kind of activity on the Lord's Day. Sometimes, uh, one thing that um, Joey Piper mentioned uh, when, when I, we were down at his church in uh, Escondido during the seminary days, was that uh, perhaps a bit of mild physical activity is just the thing that you need in order to wake you up and sharpen your mind so that when you come to worship, you're not falling asleep. And I found that to be true. If, I, if I'm exhausted from the morning, uh, that it's hard for me to, to come and do this without doing a little bit of activity just to get the blood circulating. So maybe walking up and down the stairs a few times and doing a few push-ups for just a few minutes to get the blood flowing, that be, that's appropriate because it's, it's helping us do what the Lord has called us to do on this day, which is to worship Him. It's not trying to, uh, to do these things with some other goal in mind, like I need to keep myself in shape so that I can uh, do this other thing that I want to do during the week. I mean, that's not my goal. My goal is so that I'll have a clear mind and be able to communicate what the Lord would have to communicate. You need to make sure that you do just enough and only enough and that you're doing it for the right reasons. We need to make sure that we use holy time for holy purposes. And that really applies to the rest of the week as well. If we become addicted to recreation, it can also steal away our time. And time is something the Lord tells us we need to redeem because we only have a little bit of it. Whether you're older or younger, when you're younger, you really don't realize how quickly time goes, but it goes very quickly. You need to redeem the time when you're young, especially when you get old, but we all need to redeem all the time that we have. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 16. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Physical exercise profits little, does profit a little. We should do some for our health, 
We should do, you know, recreated things for our souls and for the good of our body. But we need to make sure that we don't get addicted to it and do too much of it because the Lord has called us to something else that's work, our vocation. And we need to make sure that we are being faithful in those things. So make sure that it's not offensive to God. Second, or, or next, make sure that, that what you do doesn't offend other people, doesn't hurt other people, and doesn't hurt yourself. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. Now here's where we have to be careful with other types of recreations that, that really aren't recreation as we're considering it this evening, but recreation as we often think of the word recreation, and that means going out and killing yourself doing some kind of sport. Okay? There are certain things we have to be careful because they can potentially be offensive and they can be harmful. Have you ever, uh, you know, for those of us who are older, this hasn't happened in a long time, but when, you know, when you're younger or when you were younger, did you ever have a friend who got two sets of boxing gloves and he says, come on, let's go at it? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's not a wise thing to do because when you start boxing with your friend, he's not going to be your friend for very long, especially if he <laughs> tags you. If he tags you many times with those gloves, you tag him, okay? Boxing is not a good recreation because it does make other people angry and it makes you angry and you know there's a lot of different kinds of sports that do that that are what we call contact sports like football boxing of course is, is probably the, you know, the, the the greatest offender but football obviously is a contact sport if you play football you can get angry playing football you know if you get tackled too many times or you get run down you know by people mowing through the line or whatever it may be have you ever watched a uh, Australians play rugby <laughs> I've never seen such a brutal game. Uh, it, but I mean, the guys that are playing it are look pretty, pretty husky and rough too. You know, you have to be to play that. But I mean, they virtually plow the people into the field with every every play. As soon as you get the ball, you're you're mowed down and you're you're piled on. I don't know how you can play that game and not get angry. I think uh, I saw a number of fights break out in that game with hockey too. We really have to be careful. And those also can be potentially harmful. I mean, how many people have, have you know, broken their knees and, and injured themselves in many different ways playing sports like this? We need to be careful. What about skydiving? Is that a, a safe recreation <laughs> to do? Uh, sometimes the chute doesn't open. Of course, that only happens about once, doesn't it? So. <laughs> Cliff diving, maybe not a good thing to do either. Ski jumping, that looks pretty... pretty uh, Dangerous, you know, I mean, they're going pretty fast. They're pretty high. You ever seen people wipe out on, on that? Uh, they get injured pretty badly. Uh, sometimes it can be done safely most of the time, but it has the potential for serious injury. There was somebody I understand, I, I haven't had a chance really to see any of the Olympics, but I understand that somebody was killed doing the, the luge. And as you know, that's solid ice, this track, and this, this thing that's going really quickly, if that thing wipes out, uh, you can easily die, and, and the person did die. It's not necessarily a safe thing to do, so you need to be careful. There are also certain kinds of competitions. I, I read uh, recently, I was amazed at, at how long the, the record is for holding your breath. That, that's something that, that people do for competition, and they do it for recreation. But the record for holding your breath is something like 19 and a half minutes, if you can believe that. But that's underwater. For above water, it's something like 10 minutes. That's hard to believe, too. But 19 minutes underwater. And in order to do it, they hyperventilate. And I think that they, they do various things to uh, uh, various disciplines to slow down their pulse and, and to, to make their body use as little oxygen as possible. They go into cold water, which further slows down their, their pulse and, and their circulation and so forth. 19 and a half minutes. But they discovered that doing that causes brain damage. You know, as you can imagine, that's oxygen deprivation. So we need to be careful what we do. And of course, uh, I think also it goes without saying, our recreations need to be things that aren't going to destroy other people's property, uh, like the, uh, you know, the, the age-old picture of the children playing uh, baseball on the street, and one of them you know, hits the ball and goes through the neighbor's window and so forth. Uh, that, the potential is there, which means you, you shouldn't be playing that kind of game on the street because that's bound to happen. It always happens, doesn't it? Or if on the 4th of July, you happen to have, well, God forbid, illegal fireworks, you know, bottle rockets, sometimes those things land on people's shake roofs 
and set them on fire, we need to make sure that our recreations are legal and that they can't potentially damage somebody else's property or their life. We need to make sure in our recreations that we don't seek after our own glory. That's another thing about professional sports. Sometimes we, we pursue sports for no other reason than to get people to admire us. I was talking with um, Jeremiah about this this morning. I don't see him here this evening, but sometimes that's why young, young men begin to lift weights is because they want young ladies to admire them and just how foolish that really is because really it's character that matters and not, not the physique. But if that's why you're lifting weights, that's not a good reason to do it, is it? You're just trying to glorify yourself and draw attention to yourself. Whenever we do things to get other people to glorify us, then we're not doing them for the right reason. And we're walking alone. We're not walking with God. Jesus says in John 5.44, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and yet you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Remember what Paul says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if you're doing it for your glory, then you're not doing it for God's glory, in which case it becomes sinful. So along these lines, we need to make sure that our recreations draw us nearer to God and not further away. Anything that centers on self, anything that feeds the flesh, anything that increases our lusts, anything that incites the, our sin in our lives is wrong in God's eyes. I remember a very wise saying that, um, let's see, it was um, John and Charles Wesley's mother, I'm trying to remember her name was, Susanna Wesley. She told her boys as they were growing up, anything you do that takes away your love for the Lord, anything you do that takes away your zeal for the Lord, anything you do that draws you away from the Lord, that to you is sin even if it happens to be something that isn't sinful in and of itself. And food is not sinful in and of itself, but addiction to food can be. There's, there's many things that God has given to us, again, to refresh us for, you know, food-wise, drink-wise, recreation-wise, but can become an idol, can become an addiction, can become something that we're using for our glory rather than God's, can be harmful to someone else, can be harmful to ourselves, we need to make sure that we're walking within the bounds that the Lord has given to us. He doesn't want us foolishly to throw our lives away on anything or come under the dominion of any sin. The, the psalm that I read this morning for the call to worship, establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any sin have dominion over me. Sin is a very addicting thing and it can easily dominate our lives. Christ came to set us free from those things so that he would be our master and not sin. So don't let any of these things draw you in. Do not become addicted to them. And make sure then your recreations refresh you. Make sure they strengthen your body and don't destroy your body. Make sure they clear your mind and don't dull your mind. This is the immediate goal of recreation or refreshment. And the ultimate goal is that by doing so, you might better be able to serve the Lord. So remember, moderation in all things that are lawful and within the bounds of Christian liberty. Do everything you do, whether you eat or drink, to the glory of God. That's how we walk with Him. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply this to our hearts.